Muted. Jeg er Christian Schmidt fra Drawware, og jeg vil gerne sige tak til alle, der har valgt at bruge en uh, tre kvarters tid sammen med os her i dag. Uh, vi er rigtig mange på, så lige sådan et par hus, husholdningsråd. Uh, alle deltagere her er i mute, uh, sådan så at hvis I gerne vil, vil sige noget, uh, så er jeres mikrofon umiddelbart slukket. Men I kan kommentere på uh, og stille spørgsmål nede i panelet i, i, uh, i GoToWebinar. Um, jeg har min kollega fra Netfort med, som hedder Dara Delaney. Dara, are you there? I'm here, Christian. Awesome. Uh, Dara is from uh, Netfort and will do the, the practical demo. Dara, I hope it's okay that I'm going to switch to Danish for a short while. No problem. Awesome, thank you. I warned you about that, so this is a crash course in Danish. <laughs> Så øh, det her øh, webinar, det drejer sig om, hvordan man praktisk håndterer de nogle, nogle af de ting, der øh, vedrører vores nye persondataforordning, øh, som jo endnu ikke er vedtaget i Danmark endnu, men først forventes vedtaget her i starten af næste år. Og øh, normalt, når jeg snakker med vores kunder om det her, så har jeg sådan en, en to timers præstation kun om øh, persondataforordning og de praktiske dele, og den kan jeg selvfølgelig ikke holde lige nu. Men øh, det vi normalt koncentrerer os om, når det gælder persondataforordningen, kan jeg lige herned, det er øh, det, der vedrører artikel 32 til 35. Og rent praktisk, så gælder det om det, der hedder behandlingssikkerhed og det, der hedder notifikationspligten. Øh, nede i behandlingssikkerhed, øh, der står, øh, hvad det er, man forventes at skulle gøre, for at sikre sine personfølsomme data mod, at de øh, uforvarende kommer i andres hænder, eller bliver ændret, eller slettet, eller noget lignende. Og problemet med sådan noget her, det er, at der står jo ikke lige præcis, hvad man praktisk IT-mæssigt skal gøre, men en af de ting, som jeg hæfter mig meget ved, det er den sidste, sidste sætning, der står hernede, nemlig at man skal tilvejebringe en procedure for regelmæssig afprøvning, vurdering og evaluering af effekten af de tekniske og organisatoriske foranstaltninger til sikring af behandlingssikkerhed. Bag det her lidt kanselisprogsagtige statement gemmer der sig, at man rent faktisk skal skabe en proces for IT-sikkerhed, som skal afprøves, evalueres, dokumenteres og revurderes. Og det er ikke særlig mange af vores kunder, der rent faktisk gør det i dag. Samtidig så findes der i den næste paragraf, det der hedder notifikationspligten. Det er det, der handler om, at man skal melde til tilsynsmyndighederne, hvis man opnår, eller hvis, hvis man er udsat for en databrist, altså det, der var i den sidste paragraf. Og her står så i detaljer, hvad det er, man forventer sig skulle kunne fortælle tilsynsmyndighederne inden for 72 timer. 72 timer, det var altså tre døgn. Og det er godt nok ikke særlig meget. Så forud for, at man rent faktisk skal kunne opfylde de her krav, så skal man have en lang række procedurer og, og, og afprøvninger klar før maj næste år. Øhm, for at, øh, for at øh, vi, der lever af at sælge sådan noget software, ikke skal komme og banke på, og så skal I fra, fra nu af til mig næste år høre om, hvorfor I skal købe det ene, det andet eller det tredje, så har vi valgt at sige, at man skal gå frem efter en bestemt metodik. Og den metodik, som vi anbefaler, det er det, der hedder uh, SANS 20 Critical Security Controls. Og SANS uh, 20 Critical Security Controls, det er uh, en liste af punkter, som man detaljeret skal igennem, for at vurdere, hvor godt opfylder man rent faktisk de her krav. Det er ikke et IT-sikkerhedsframework som ISO, selvom det kan mappes til ISO 7001 og 2, men det er en række praktiske foranstaltninger, som man skal igennem. Og det, det rent faktisk betyder, det er, at ud for hver af de her individuelle punkter, er der en række tilhørende spørgsmål, som man skal svare på. Og når man så har svaret på dem, det gør man i hjælp af sådan en regneark. Vi har valgt at lave sådan et, et simpelt regneark, hvor man svarer på de her værdier fra metal fra 0 til 5, så 0 betyder, ups, øh, 0 betyder øh, irrelevant, og 1 betyder, at man slet ikke opfylder kravene, 3 betyder, at man opfylder det midt, 
midt imellem, og 5 betyder, at man er helt bingeling. Så når man har udfyldt alle de her punkter, så får man det, der hedder en security posture, og de står i, i sådan et ark her. Og jeg har rent faktisk taget sådan et ark med, som vi lige har lavet for en af vores kunder, så I kan se, hvordan det rent faktisk ser ud. Så her har, her har kunden givet os en, eller vi har sammen med kunden sat os ned og fundet ud af, hvad er deres nuværende security postures. Og det giver så den her kolonne her, og det giver en security posture på 49 ud af 100 mulige. Og så sætter man sig ned og finder ud af, hvor skulle man egentlig gerne være. Og det er så de tal, man taster ind i den her kolonne, og det giver så en, en posture på 71 og en afstand på 22. Og det vil sige, hvis man kan flytte sig fra den her kolonne og til den her kolonne, så har man hævet sin IT-sikkerhed med 45%. Det er selvfølgelig lidt muligt abstrakt, men når man skal forklare andre mennesker noget om IT-sikkerhed, så er det rart at kunne ligesom sætte det op i en procentvis ting. Det her diagram over til højre, som er sådan et radialt diagram, det forklarer så, hvad posteren er nu, og hvad posteren skal blive senere. Og så har vi så, hver gang vi laver det her, tilknyttet en række specifikke IT-sikkerhedsprojekter, og så kan man så inden for hver projekt specificere, hvad er det for nogle løsninger, man bruger. Kan man bruge de eksisterende, eller skal man have nogle nye, hvad for nogle processer skal man tage i værk osv. Og det smarte ved det, det er jo, at det giver egentlig mulighed for, kan man sige, struktureret at vurdere, hvordan skal man rent faktisk gå til værks med IT-sikkerhed. Vi sælger det her som en service at lave det her til jer, så hvis der er nogen, der er interesseret, så er I velkommen til at henvende jer til mig. Så kan man så sige, inden for hvilke punkter er det så, at Netfort og Land Guardian rent faktisk kommer ind. Og der har vi valgt at gøre det på den måde, at der findes en række specielle punkter her, og hvis man tager nogle af de her punkter, lad os se om vi kan finde dem hurtigt, øhm, så findes der kan man sige, en definition af, hvordan de her mapper til ISO-kontroller. Og de vigtigste projekter omkring det her, det er, det er relateret til det her med notifikationspligten. Så når de 72 timer starter, ja, så vil man gerne have at vide, øh, hvad er det for en bruger, der har rørt ved hvilke data? Og det kan jo så være e-mail, eller SQL, eller filer, eller et eller andet andet. Og øh, der kommer øh, et værktøj som øh, LangGuardian ind, fordi i stedet for at være baseret på IP-adresser og lignende, så er LangGuardian også baseret på informationer om, hvad brugerne foretager sig. Øh, så for at vise det i praksis, så har jeg bedt min kollega Dara fra Netfort om øh, at gå til hånde med, med, med produktet og i detaljer vise, hvordan det virker. Øh, det er selvfølgelig kun en, 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 kan man sige, en forsmag på, på produktet, så hvis det er, at I gerne vil vide noget mere om det, så øh, er I velkommen til at henvende jer til mig. Det er sådan så, at den her webinar, det optager vi som en video og sender til alle, sådan så I kan gense det, der viser, og som sagt er I velkommen til at sende mig en e-mail, i min e-mailadresse er chr.drawware.dk, hvis det er, I gerne vil vide mere. Så skal jeg lige spørge, er der nogen, der har spørgsmål her så langt? Lad os se en gang. Det lader ikke lige til at være tilfældet. Hvis I har nogle spørgsmål undervejs, så er det bare at stille dem i panelet. Så, so, so Dara? Yes, Christian. Are you still there? I am still here, yes. I am so glad to hear that. I'm going to make you the presenter now. Great, thank you. So you should be able to share your screen. Perfect. I hope everybody can see the. Um, I hope everybody can see the uh, the screen the screen from Dara. So um, 
Øh, Mikkel, hvis du lige laver en note på skærmen, så jeg kan se, om du kan se øh, deres skærm. Ja, det ser ud som om det virker. Så so, so Dara, uh, take it away. Let's see. Uh, Det leder til, at, at Dara, lad os se en gang her, øjeblik, Så lige jeg tager min, uh, min, min, uh, min skærm tilbage her. Uh, Dara, can you hear me? Ah, sorry about that, Dara. No problem. Sorry about that, Dara. I had a, a little bit of a, a problem there. You should be unmuted now. I am indeed. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Absolutely. Right. I'm sorry for that uh, little mistake. No problem at all. Okay. And you can see my screen. Absolutely. Great. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'll make a start. Um, so I'm going to focus on our product, which is called LangGuardian, and specifically the GDPR reporting. So for the, for the demo, these are some of the elements that I'm going to cover. Um, they're probably the most obvious when it comes to GDPR. Looking at IP addresses, who's communicating with you, protocols, what endpoints you're communicating with, user activity, malicious activity. I'm not going to read everything out here, but during the demo, I'm going to cover off each of these points. So I just close the best down here. Okay. So the product I'm going to show you this morning is called LandGuardian. Now, what is it? Well, it's a network traffic analysis and visibility platform. So what it does is it uses network traffic as a data source, and it then allows you to get a deeper look into that traffic both in and out of your network. What's really important here is it's both real-time and historical. The historical GDPR is the really important part because you might want to go back weeks or months or where, however you want to store data for. And it, it, it's able to match the network activity with usernames. And again, this is so important for this, this compliance standard. Even if you don't use it for GDPR, it continuously captures and retains network security and operational intelligence. So if your network is running slow, if you've got a virus, you've got a ransomware problem, whatever the problem is, you can get to the root cause with LandGuardian. It is software, so this is something you can download and trial. And one of the important things here is it does not require any agents or clients. So you don't need to go out and put a top server on your you know, laptops or tablets or servers, don't need to make any changes. In fact, we don't even need log files on most of your servers. So it's all about getting granular visibility anywhere in your network. So just on locating a source of data, now some solutions for GDPR would be log file tools, and they will read log files from servers. We don't go that way, we don't use that method. The method we use is by plugging into a span or mirror port or even use a network tap. So typically the way it works is that you download our software, deploy it as a physical or a virtual machine. 
You plug into the core of your network where you set up a monitoring port or span port, just depends on the switch brand. And you monitor the traffic going to and from the servers on your network, going to and from the internet gateway, so that if users connect to the network, if they access servers, if somebody comes from external and they come into your network, we see that traffic as it moves through the core of the network. Now this is a very simple network diagram. More complex ones like this here, three, three remote sites or two remote sites with a headquarters, you can deploy Langardian probes. Now I'm not going to go into everybody's network diagram here, but takeaway point is that the Langardian solution can scale up from a single site to multiple sites. So our primary data source is a is network traffic which we acquire through span or mirror ports. So let's take a look at the information that we capture from network traffic. So going back to my list, the first element here I want to take a look at, so these are our dashboards. I'm going to look at search and things later on, but a dashboard is just a way of gathering together a sort of collection of reports. I've got this one here, which is looking at who's communicating with who in the last 24 hours. Let's extend this report to show you more. So these are the IP addresses that are active on my network in the last 24 hours. As you can see, there's local addresses, and we've got some external ones here. So we've got a Dutch one, we've got another one here in Nicaragua, and so on. So these are the IP addresses that people are communicating with. So I can then drill down on these IP addresses to see, well, what are the connections? So in this case here, we can see this client connecting to a local host, Microsoft. But we can also see this client on my network connecting to an IP address in Sweden, one in Ireland, another one here in Ukraine, one in Japan, and the United States. So I've got an inventory here of who is communicating with who, or what devices communicate and what other devices on my, on my network. Now some of this activity could be malicious, some of it could be very normal. And we'll come back to that to have to spot the malicious traffic in a few minutes. I'm looking at 24 hours, as I mentioned, this can go back in time. So if we needed to go back and investigate an event from February, let's say, or maybe even last year, we select here from the calendar and run a report to see what was happening at that point in time. So that's the first piece of data that we capture and store is who's communicating with what. The next view of the network is protocols. So traditional network monitoring tools, they match protocols with port numbers. They, if something is over port 80, they would report that that is web traffic. But that's not very accurate. We report things differently. So we do have a top protocols report. Let me just extend it here so you see all of the entries. Let's put the graph on. So what we've got, well, 53% of traffic on this network is file share traffic. 11% is HTTP, Oracle, SQL. The crucial thing here is this is not based on port numbers. So if you run, for example, web traffic over port 8080, we report that as web traffic because we recognize the protocols, we recognize the applications. So for example, we got BitTorrent here, that could be running over port 80, but we detect that it is actually BitTorrent and it accounts for about 1% of traffic on this network. With protocols, you can drill down. So for example, on the file share protocol, drill down, we can see there was some actions, some traffic, and if we drill down on the, the actions, we can actually see the file names. So this is file share traffic. We can see the file names, what files are being accessed, what are the share names, and what are the actions some files are written to, some files have been read, mostly to do here with a PST file. So you can go from protocols drill down to see clients, IP addresses, drill down again and see the actual file names. And to complete the picture with our Active Directory integration, if I click on username here, I can actually get who was logged on to that client at that time. So Laura here in our finance department was logged on, connected to this file server, that's the share name, this is the, the file the action and how many times that file was read over the time period, which I think is 24 hours, yes. So let's go back to the dashboard. So one of the things that GTPR is, you know, get an inventory of protocols. Well, you've got that here, but with the bonus with our system is that 
when you see a protocol like file share HTTP, let's drill down on HTTP, you get detail here, not only you know, that it is HTTP, but in fact here we got some Windows update traffic, drill down to see what clients, these are the clients that are getting Windows updates, then even drill down further to see in this case what are the patches that are being downloaded off Microsoft. And again, you can get the username by clicking on the user button. So if I go back to my list here, so you can have a list of protocols, both what's coming inbound, what's moving around internally, and even what services people are connected to outside of the network. Very similar to the use case we looked at earlier on, which is IP addresses and who's connecting with what. You can also report on what endpoints you're communicating with. So two ways I want to show how you can use this data. The first one, I think I've got a report here on my dashboard. I've got inbound TCP connections. Sounds very technical, but it's a very useful report. What we get is this shows us what services are open on a firewall where somebody outside of my network is connecting inbound. If I drill down on this strange port number here, which doesn't really mean a lot, show me the applications. Well, now it starts to make more sense. It tells me this is an actual secure shell protocol. So somebody has a tunnel open. Well, where is it coming from? Show me the detail. This is coming from an IP address registered in Japan. Where is that connecting to? Well, it's connected to this IP address here, which is on my network. So I may need to check my firewall rules. So if I go back here, so what endpoints you're communicating with? So it's not just, you know, outbound, but this is more interesting. This is endpoints inside my network that people outside are connecting to. So you've got an inventory of that. The next way of looking at well, what endpoints are I connecting to is where you might focus on a particular client. So if you've got a user <coughs> who you need to investigate, or you've got a server or device on your network, and you need to know what is it communicating with, we have a search facility here. So let's put in an IP address. So I've got, let's say, 10.1.1.100. I want to investigate what endpoints that device is connecting to. Search. And we get a range of elements back here. So this tells us the protocols this client is using. This shows us any suspicious events associated with the client. Now we can see it's running BitTorrent. But to answer my question, here are the endpoints that this device is connecting to. Let's extend this report to get the full list. So this device has actually connected to 2,127 different IP addresses. Now it's running BitTorrent, so that, that kind of makes sense. It makes a lot of connections. And you can see the countries where these IP addresses are registered. So you've got a full inventory here now of all endpoints that this client connected to. You could flip it a different way. You could say, okay, forget about IP addresses. I don't know what IP address somebody had. What if we want to investigate what endpoints is Laura, the user, sorry, not an IP address, a username. What endpoints is Laura connected to? She's a user on the network. You can run a search. You get protocols here and you can drill down and see what connections, I've looked at the web stuff, what external sites, what endpoints is that user connecting to. So you got an inventory here of both IP addresses and usernames of who's connecting to what on the network. And that covers this that point about reporting on user activity. It's when we talk to our customers, that is one of the main reasons they purchase and use Langardian on a daily basis is because they want to monitor, they want to troubleshoot user problems. Networks running slow, users complaining, reports from managers, lots of reasons they need to report on user activity. Let's go back and have a look at some more user activity. So again, on my GDPR dashboard, I've got further down here, I got the top users on my network. Now we've already looked at Laura. Let's take a look at Robert here. So Robert is our second most active user accounts for around 70% of the traffic on my network is associated with Robert. But what is Robert doing? Click on the segment, Oracle, sounds business related, some encrypted traffic, HTTP, again, some BitTorrent here, looks like got some BitTorrent on this network, some web traffic, drill down to the connections, 
is on our own website, nefer.com. It's on website here, our T that I eat. I suspect that's probably streaming or something like that, probably on the news. Let's go back here. So again, for one or two clicks, you can drill down and get detail about what users are doing on the network. So you can search for a user, or you can go from the dashboard, you can click and drill down and see, well, I don't, why, why is Laura here? She's 50% of traffic is associated with Laura. Why is that? I think we investigated that. It's mostly file shared traffic. And from here then, we can see that it's PST file. So she's actually a PST file and some copy in a virtual machine here, 5.92 gigabytes. And remember, this is all done passively. There is no, um, we don't communicate with the user's device. We don't uh, slow the network down by being in line. We're not like a firewall. This is done simply by monitoring network traffic. So think of Langardian as like a CCTV camera for your network. So it's watching your network. And if you need to look at something, you need to go back in time to see, well, how did somebody get in? And you can look at our recordings of traffic and see who was communicating with what device at that time. Okay, so that's user activity, that's endpoints, that's IP addresses. But amongst all of this traffic and all of this data that's moving around, is there anything malicious there? Can I set up some alerts? Well, we can, so let's go back to the dashboard. So a few ways we can look at this. This is probably the, the most popular ways. We've got a top network events report here. Now behind the scenes in our product, there is an intrusion detection engine running. So it is worth watching out for malicious behavior, suspicious behavior. Let's extend the report to show you the full view of it. Now some items here you would say, well, Skype, well, that's not too interesting. Some people do want to detect it, so it's, it's here as an option. We've got detected BitTorrent on our network. That's definitely, that could be seen as malicious or you know, traffic we don't want on our network. We got some Dropbox, again, you may decide that that's not relevant. Other people would like to get alerts based on that. So anything here suspicious, if I had ransomware problem, if I had some virus, that would appear in this list. I do have a, a network scan, so that's somebody scanning the network. Well, what's happening here? We we'll break it down by the source IP. And we've got this IP address here, it's creating a lot of connections. So it's looks like it's connecting to hundreds and hundreds because it's 6,545 connection attempts here from that client to these external IP addresses over port 80. So I certainly would want to investigate that client here. So let's go back. So what you have with this top network events, it's sorted by priority. The priority ones are worth investigating. These are suspicious or malicious activity on the network that I would want to investigate. If you need alerts, on this activity. For example, on the BitTorrent, if I just click on that there and set the option here to send me an email. So send an email, somebody put a message here. Save that off. That will now send me an email, give me an alert if somebody starts to run BitTorrent on my network. Now the, uh, the, the, uh, the events on my network here, they're not that interesting. There isn't anything really. I need. Uh, there isn't a virus on my network right now. There isn't any uh, very you know, malicious type activity on my network. But I have this element here, which will constantly update with the latest events that are triggering. So going back um, to how much data you send that of your relates to files. Uh, relation to emails. Kind of looked at that earlier on. But let me show you some more ways we can look at file activity on a network and how much data has been sent around. To do that, we can use the search facility here. So we've looked at IP address, we've looked at usernames. Let's look at some file names. So for example, I need to check who accessed a particular spreadsheet. So it was a sales forecast file. So I just put in the file or folder name and I get some data back. Now the, the element here I want to expand is the one with the usernames. Let's expand that element. So what have we got? Well we had a couple of files here, budget forecast, 
just to find them interesting, let's drill down and see what happened here. Okay, so I've got the information I need here. The file was deleted off the network. It looks like that was Robert Schmidt, and I've got the date and time here when that file was removed from the network. So I've got a full audit trail here, and plus I've actually got the amount of data associated with that transaction as well. And this is something that comes into GDPR. It's about how much data is in, how much you know from file names, sizes. Um, just having an audit trail there of who's doing what with files on the network. So this actually is used a lot by our customers. Stuff goes missing, they want to track it back to a user, they want to track it back to a time so they can get the file restored, talk to the user, tell them stop deleting files off the network. So you've got a full audit trail here of your file activity. This works for both Windows file shares and file shares based on the NFS protocol, the network file share protocol. So, so Dara? Yeah? Um, Imagine that you're a company and you get a call Friday afternoon from a journalist saying that he's uh, looking at a spreadsheet with personal uh, identifiable information from a certain company uh, that is available on the internet. Um, and you know you, you get to talk to the company and, and they say, okay, so what is the name of this spreadsheet or document or where do you have those data from? So this this uh, this feature becomes super valuable. So you can basically search for document names or files or, or whatever and kind of get to see when in time was that touched by whom. So it might not be a normal user. It could be an, a hidden admin account that you didn't know about that was exfiltrating data to the internet. And that is exactly directly what is uh, in the rules of the uh, GDPR, which is in Danish Person Data Forwarding, which just states that it, within 72 hours you need to tell the authorities what happened and what data was touched. Absolutely, yeah. And um, it's even even beyond that. It's just such a useful, um, it's such a such useful data to have at your fingertips. Um, for, for any network administrator or any network manager um, because there's always something happening with that data that you need to go back and find out even if you know if it's not external journalists it's some user internally it's a HR mm -hmm. manager everybody wants reports so this is this data is used a lot by our customers yeah makes sense absolutely thanks for that question okay so what I will cover, there, there is also, um, you can set up uh, advanced uh, rules. So, set, for example, you could say, if somebody outside of our HR department access some file on the HR share, will I want an alert? Because that's not normal. So we do have a, an option in here in settings where we can write alerts. So you can write rules, add a rule. I'm not going to cover this day, it's kind of almost like a separate session, but we have a, a, a scripting type language here where you can say if it's a file share, if it's not HR to, to the HR folder, we'll generate an alert. So you can create these alert rules based on business, um, the way your, your network is designed around business rules. So you can say if somebody outside of HR access HR file, then send an alert to the HR manager. So you can automate this here that you don't need to be always running reports. Just on you know external journalists and people sending data, obviously Dropbox, you know, if somebody's using Dropbox, you might want to drill down and see what clients are using Dropbox. But also emails, uh, what emails are coming in and out of your network? We've got a, an inventory here, or an audit trail of emails by subject line. This is monitoring SMTP email. Let's have a look here. So what have we got? Well, we've got um, a couple of subject lines here credit card refund, Bank of America security alert, sounds like spam to me or phishing attack. Drill down on that and you can see the source internally for this email. It looks like it's going to USIP. Um, it's from to Helen Jones. Scroll across here. There's no attachments on it. We don't store the entire email, but we store the from to subject line. But what's useful here if there's any attachments leaving your network. So let's go in and have a look at the attachments. So any emails with attachments. Let's run this report. And I do have one email. Um, not many emails on this network moving around, but this one here. 
to lauralocalauthority.com, DHL shipment return label for DHP shipment. Sounds like a, a phishing type attack to me, but there's an attachment here on this email. I might want to talk to Laura, tell her, you know, definitely do not be opening any attachments because from our records, we can see that there are phishing type emails being directed at you. So you've got an audit trail in here as well of your file activity, or sorry, your, your SMTP email activity. Again, captured from network traffic. The other um, element or type of protocol that what we call, when we drill down here, we call this decoding. So when you saw me going from Windows file share traffic volume and drilling down and seeing file names, we call that protocol decoding. So we decode the protocol and we extract data such as file names, actions. So we decode web traffic, we decode file share traffic. Another protocol we decode is SQL traffic, database traffic. So we generate an audit trail of queries and what database or databases are being accessed. So uh, how do I get to this report? Let me show you here. Inventory, SQL Server reports. I just went for um, top statement. It's one of the more popular ones here. So one of the most active statements or statements that are run the most on my network. Well, this one here, select, doesn't really mean a lot. Let's see what servers are being queried. Now, it's quite a bit of detail here, but the uh, application people love this. You've got the source, destination, the SQL, it's a SQL server, time, the username, application name, type, the database, type statement, and the actual statement itself. I think the previous screen is easier to view this. So you've got all of these statements here that have been run off your SQL databases. Um, again, leave it running in the background. It, it creates an inventory. But if you needed to, to uh, let's go for some troubleshooting here. SQL Server. Let's go for um, top statement type. So what type of statements do we have? Well, obviously most of the statements on this network are selects. People are just accessing data. But we actually have, a, uh, somebody has dropped a table on this network. So let's have a look and see what's happening here. So from this client here, and we can get the username. So who is this? So Robert here, he's been, he's been dropping a table here. So Robert at 0602, um, very early in the morning, um, he actually dropped the credit card table here for some reason. So this could be a crucial piece of information. Uh, when it comes to, you know, who knows, could have done it deliberately, but we have a record here of Robert dropping that entire table off our, off our, off our database on this, um, this SQL server so, here. So, Derek, can I ask you a question again? Sure. So, so in fact, if you have personal uh, identifiable information, the PII, in, in databases such as SQL, and I, I believe a lot of the customers have that, this gives you an ability to basically do a search and say, who have backed up or changed or exported data from certain tables that are uh, critical, and then being able to actually use that as documentation for what really happened. Is that correct? Or? That, that is correct, yeah. So the type of statements, so for example, alter, begin, commit, these are the type of statements that we store. Okay, so it's all your, all your, 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 you know, your inserts, your executes, your drops. Uh, yeah, so you've got an inventory there, you've got an audit trail of who has done what on your SQL databases. Um, like I, it wasn't SQL, but it's, it's very similar. We worked with a customer two weeks ago. It was a local authority, like a commune. And they uh, had an, it was, so I had a problem actually within the IT department where you had two network people, or two network admins who, who didn't like each other, okay? I don't know what <laughs> happened. They may have been outside of work or whatever, but they didn't like each other. And one of them thought was, was kind of paranoid and he felt that the other person was monitoring his data, was accessing his data. And he went to HR and complained about the fact that he was being monitored and his emails were being accessed and all his files were being accessed by his colleague within the IT department. And um, HR had to try and sort this mess out. So they used LangGuardian to go back. We went back to October last year to get an inventory of all of the data that this user had accessed. And he actually, he'd access HR data and different things. But 
all of the all of the when you look through the data, they're all tasks that would be normal as per his job. So he changed some permissions, he did some things. And they use that then to sort this mess out between these two staff members uh, to show that these are the systems this user accessed. You know, th th there's nothing unusual here. Um, so it it went right to the top. In fact, it went right to not it went past the HR. It went right up to the S the, the CEO of, of that council. Um, because there was thoughts maybe there was data being leaked out, there was information being accessed. So the Langardian reports, and they even, sorry, last thing on it, they even brought in a third party um, uh, forensics person, uh, IT forensic guy to come in to look at our data, okay, because they, they wanted a second opinion, and he says, no, this, what, what this is, the Langardian is telling me is, is fine, I can see what's happening here, and it wasn't an issue. So. Without our system, they they would still have a problem there where users were just all saying, "Well, you're watching me and you're you're accessing my data." So with our tool, they could go back and they could see what was happening. So complicated, messy, you know, event, but it, it we sorted it out for them with our the information we capture. Okay, so um, now I, I'm. I've not covered every element of Langardian, but these are the primary ones when it comes to GDPR. It's about creating an audit trail of who's communicating with what, what are the usernames, what are the endpoints, what are the actions, like a file read, like a SQL drop, anything malicious, anything unusual out there, scanning, viruses, and how much data, how, the volumes, the quantities, and where is it going, country codes. Muted. Is there anything I've missed, Christian? Unmuted. Uh, I don't actually think so in terms okay. of uh, the GDPR. I know the product does a lot of other things, but yes. this, this was what we particularly wanted to focus on. Um, I think what I just wanted to mention uh, before we, we end this session is that um, we can actually map directly from these uh, SANS 20 critical security controls into ISO, uh, such as ISO 20, 27002. And that means whenever you embrace this framework, you actually directly get compliant with part of the ISO standard. So there is a good way of, of, uh, of building um, building momentum and, and making sure that you keep to certain standards. Um, I also wanted to point out that we have a complete mapping of all our products towards the uh, SANS critical security controls framework and that NetFord actually covers uh, four major categories of this. So, so when you want to check out are we covered in different categories, then this is a very good way of, of uh, going about it. So at this current time, I just want to... Um, uh, Sorry, Christian, I'll finish. I, 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 my section is our national holiday here tomorrow, so happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. I'll end <laughs> with that. <laughs> Absolutely the same to you. So at this point in time, and I'm just going to take the, um, the screen back here to myself. Um, uh, I just want to point out that we do have a section on our homepage for webinars. Um, and this, this is uh, the one on, on the 4th of April, we'll have two uh, webinars, one for uh, web-based computer or awareness training, IT security awareness training, and, and one for more detailed look into the GDPR. Um, are there any questions that I could take right now? Please, uh, if you have any questions, let me know by... by um, by putting in the questions in the chat window. So there is one question here, Dara. What in terms of hardware? What does what does Langardian require? Okay, um, could you make me presenter again? You, can, or you bet I can. Just a second. Um, there, there you go. Sure. Okay. So. Um, I'm just going to go to our website, nefor.com, <clears throat> because uh, I've got the answer on this. So in the, um, if you go for the, just click on free trial here. 
you got the minimum hardware requirements, okay? So what we require is a physical or a virtual. Let me talk about physical first. So you need two network cards, usually two core CPU, dual core CPU, eight gigabytes of memory and about 50 gigabytes of available hard drive. So it's 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 really a, a medium server, you know, in fact a low power server is perfectly fine. The most crucial part is the two network cards. One is for the management of the device and one is your span, go back to your span or mirror port. So on a physical box, that's what you need. Uh, in fact, you could even trial the software on a PC if you could get two network cards in. So that's the minimum requirements. One of the interesting things with our product, uh, because it's software based, you can deploy it on VMware, Hyper-V, VirtualBox. So you could deploy this as a virtual machine as well. So you, you have two virtual card requirements, dual core, two CPUs, allocate 8 gigs of memory, 50 gigs of hard drive. So you could deploy this on Hyper-V or VMware. So on the, um, if you go to network.com, just click to download, the, the, there's, the minimum requirements are listed here. Um, up to yourself how you want to deploy, whether physical or virtual. It says, just a point here, does not install a Windows. This is not a Windows app. Um, there is, you don't need an operating system. Everything is included. It has its own OS, its own database. Everything is included in the install. So there's no Windows. It's not a, it's not a, a piece of software that sits on top of anything else. It's a completely self-contained um, install with operating system, the whole lot. Uh, Dara, I have another question here as well. Um, if, we, if you have remote network segments, i.e., there are traffic transversing the network that aren't part of the central network. What, sure. what, what do you, how do you handle that? Okay, so just back on my diagram here, um, in that case, we have what we call probes, or remote probes. So in that remote network, that remote segment, you can deploy our software, same, same installation. You plug into the core switch or the whatever, the, distribution switches at that remote network. All the analysis is done remotely on this system here. And then updates are sent, either whatever, through an MPLS crowd, through the internet, however it is, it's sent securely, it's all encrypted, so that it's the updates then are stored on the central manager. So your central manager becomes your primary point of reference. So we have some customers with um, up on 20 probes in different data centers around the world. Um, Half our customers just have a single instance of our product, but some customers, as I said, have 20 probes in different parts of their network. So it's about picking where your data resides, where your data centers are, and putting a probe in those locations. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I also have one, I think it's the last question here, uh, at least for now. Um, if, if there are things that the product analyzes that you don't want to see? Yes. Is there a uh, ability to turn some of all this functionality off, or? Yes, there is. Yeah. So let me just show you that here. Let me. I don't want to mess up our online demo. Let me go in here. This one is fine. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm going to go live system. So on our, what we talk about probes. So a probe has what we call a sensor. They're just the network cards. So I've got one here connects to the core. I can click on the sensor, and change the settings. And within the settings here, you have the option to switch off or switch on what features. If you don't want file share monitoring, switch it off. If you don't want um, SQL or whatever, whatever options you don't want, you, have, you, you, can, you can switch things on or off here. So that's how you can control the modules. You, you, can, you can enable or disable them. Another um, way to filter data, and this Actually, sorry, it's back on that page. Go back again. You can also set up what we call a, a BPF filter, so not host 10.101. So you can actually say to tell the Land Guardian, look, for whatever reason, do not monitor that host. Hmm. Okay, so you can either disable them the the feature, like the file share monitoring completely, or you could tell the system, look, don't monitor this host or this host or this host. So there are options there to exclude certain data or don't capture certain data. Hmm. Um, one of the most popular ones is the web. Some people might not want to monitor web uh, usage, so you can switch that off and just leave the file share monitoring on, for example. Okay. Uh, there's also one here, uh, how is the product licensed? 
Okay, so it's licensed based on uh, there's two factors. So in its most simple form, how many users have you got on your network, or how many employees have you got? So when we say users, that's how many Active Directory accounts have you got enabled? Or if you don't know the answer to that, well, how many employees are in your company? Is there 250? So if it's, let's say 250, you fit into a band, so that it costs X amount of money for that size of a deployment. It's not per seat, it's not like you need a client for every single desktop, it's like 100, 200, 200, 300. So you'll fit into a band, it's based on the number of users, and that's why how your price, you, you get your price back. The probes which we talked about, they're in the extras. So you could say, okay, we have 400 users and we got two remote locations. So on, your, on a price, on a quotation, you will see the Langardian price plus the price for an additional probe. Okay, so that's the two, two elements to our pricing, number of users and how many probes. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see, are there any more questions? Um, as from what I can see right now, there are no more questions. So, so Dara, at this point in time, um, I'd really like to thank you for your great help of showing Netfort Lane Guardian. I'm just no going to take the, uh, the control back here and, and switch to Danish sure. real quick. Um, yeah. So, jeg vil gerne have lov til at sige tak for alle, der valgte at bruge tid sammen med os uh, på det her webinar. Uh, hvis I har nogen spørgsmål, så er I meget velkommen til at sende dem til mig på e-mail eller ringe til os. Um, og ellers så sender vi alle, der har deltaget her, en, uh, et link til den optaget udgave, så I kan se uh, webinaret igen. Rigtig mange tak, og fortsat god torsdag. You're finished, Christian?